All right. First of all, I'm going to read y'all something. I'm going to read you something. This great thing. December 1777, General George Washington moved the Continental Army to their winter quarters at Valley Forge. Though revolutionary forces had secured a pivotal victory at Sarasota, Saratoga in New York in September and October, Washington's army suffered defeats at Brandywine, Paoli, and the German town of Pennsylvania. The rebel capital of Philadelphia fell into British hands by the time the army marched into Valley Forge on December 19th. They were suffering not only from cold, hunger, and fatigue, from low morale in the wake of the disastrous Philadelphia campaign. Washington described Valley Forge as a dreary kind of place and uncomfortably provided. Only 20 miles from British-occupied Philadelphia in eastern Pennsylvania, Valley Forge presented a strategic location that allowed Washington's army to stay close to the city while maintaining a defensible position and offer access to clean water and firewood. However, in spite of these advantages, Washington's army was ill-prepared for the encampment that would last six months. The army supplied basic necessities like food and clothing ran perpetually short, coupled with the wintertime cold and the diseases that ran rampant through the camp. This lack of provisions created the infamously miserable conditions of Valley Forge. The army camp at Valley Forge consisted of as many as 12,000 men, as well as smaller numbers of African Americans and Native American soldiers. A number of women and children, including officers' wives, were also present at Valley Forge, having joined their husbands or family members in the encampment. While wintering in the camp, soldiers worked together to build huts for shelter. The unsanitary conditions and shortages of food and blankets contributed to the disease and exhaustion, which continually plagued the camp. The lack of clothing alone, including shoes, socks, and coats, left as many as 3,000 of Washington's troops unfit for service creating an image of starving, wearied soldiers leaving bloody footprints in the snow and ice. Because it was so cold, and they didn't have pro the, the feet cracked. They would just... And 
there was no getting up. My last story. And I told the guy, like that, that there's wooden huts, fires for ages and years before. Um, <clears throat> a Continental Army private, Joseph Plum Martin, wrote that the Army's new winter quarters left them, quote, in a truly forlorn condition, no clothing, no provisions, and a disheartened and as disheartened as need be. Um, Though Washington pleaded with Continental Congress and state governors to obtain food and supplies for his suffering army, starvation and such diseases as tip, typhus and smallpox, and a lack of protection from the elements caused the death of more than 2,000 soldiers. So, a sixth of the people, one in every six died. So they were there. Washington eventually resorted to sending men, led by Nathaniel Green, on a foraging mission to procure what provisions could be found in the surrounding countryside. Beyond vying with Congress for his supplies, the supplies his army desperately needed, Washington also had to also contend with threats to his authority that came from ordeals like the Conway Cabal and rivalries within military leaders. Washington's steady leadership was crucial in keeping the army intact through the logistical and administrative hardships of the winter of 77 and 78, and it is likely accounted for the fact that there was never a mass desertion or mutiny at Valley Forge. Despite brutal conditions, Valley Forge marked a milestone in the army's military experience. In February of 1778, Baron Frederick von Steuben arrived at Valley Forge where Washington appointed him unofficial Inspector General of the Army shortly thereafter. Baron von Steuben worked to bring uniformity to the Continental soldiers who had, who had seen combat but lacked the mar mar marital training, martial training, to pose an effective threat to the British. He developed a system of drill for the entire Army and taught the men combat maneuvers that equipped them to rival well trained British raiders. Steuben's previous experience in the Prussian Army during the Seven Years' War prepared him to oversee the military training Washington's men so desperately needed. And by the end of that encampment at Valley Forge, the Army had undergone a significant transformation from ragtag and weary recruits to an ordered and disciplined fighting force. The thing I, I try to get across to y'all is that <clears throat> there. All this stuff was real. It was life. And you had the colonies. And you had England. England was the best military, the strongest economy in the world. Colonies was a bunch of loosely together people that had it made. They were 3,000 miles across the ocean. England wasn't in their face, but they had all the benefits of being a part of the greatest empire around. So why in the world would a bunch of nothings decide to fight a war that they can't win against the strongest country in the world? Things aren't great here now, but Number one, there's, I don't know if there's many of us that would say, yeah, I'll get on a boat that I don't know where it's going and I probably won't get there just to leave. And then I sure am not gonna go out and take my gun that doesn't shoot straight and fight the United States Army. But that's what they did. So, but it, it was real life people that, that did it. So what we're gonna do in the next couple of weeks is figure out how America got here, why America got here, and just the steps it, it took and what, how it all got, how it all happened. So we're gonna start with English history. Um, Jamestown. Have you ever heard of Jamestown? Uh, it's the first English settlement, permanent English settlement. In America. I don't really care.
care that y'all know a lot of dates. I'm gonna give you this just for perspective. 1608 is when Jamestown started in Virginia. In 1620, the Pilgrims landed at Plymouth. Is Massachusetts. And Massachusetts and Virginia become the two main colonies in America. But Jamestown was first. There had been another uh, Roanoke. It started a little earlier, but we don't know what happened to it. Either all the people died or they got attacked or kidnapped or, or we don't know. It didn't last. But yeah, Jamestown and Virginia first. Plymouth was second in Massachusetts. Those are the two biggest colonies. Now I want to go to, we're going to come back to number two. Uh, actually, we'll go ahead and do number three. The idea of limited government. Rule of law was number one. That the government is limited by law. The second thing was representative democracy. Electing people to make decisions. The people having some kind of say so over what's going on. Limited government, representative democracy, which gives them a say so, gives them power over what's over what's going on. started sometime in the in the 800s 900s whatever some a long time ago they had a monarchy and in the 11th century which means sometime in the thousands some of the nobles when I say nobles those are the people who became the house of lords that's the they're in the royal family, but they're not the king. They created an advisory board called Parliament. So Parliament was created, the House of Lords, which wasn't called the House of Lords. The Parliament started as a group that would advise the king and say, here's what we think about stuff. Wasn't elected, had really no power other than what the king would listen to. Now question number four kind of shifts gears and I don't want to get the House of Commons was not created yet. This was hundreds of years before that, but bicameral means two houses. And eventually, Parliament would have two houses, the House of Lords and the House of Commons. House of Commons is the elected representatives. Now, they're not around yet. Somewhere, 14, 15, 1600s, somewhere in here, the House of Commons comes about. So it's a long, this is a long time before the House of Commons, but eventually the House of Commons, the elected representatives, these aren't elected, but that is elected. My capital means two houses. I don't care either about the date, it's just it was a long time, this was a long time coming. Now, 
gonna tell you a story here, and this is not exactly how it happened. This is a generalization of how it happened. Uh, in 1215, in a little town called Runny Mead, Parliament, the nobles, were upset with the king. And it had to do with taxes or the king, what the king was doing. They weren't happy. So they invited the king to a barbecue at Runny Mead. Said, hey, come on, king, come on up here. And the king shows up, he opens the door, and all of them pull their swords out. And <laughs> there's the king sitting there, there's all these swords in his head. Didn't necessarily happen like that, but it sounds good. Um, and they said, King, you're gonna sign this piece of paper. And he said, Okay, yeah, I'll sign it. He signed the Magna. This was kind of like, um, it was kind of like the, the, the Declaration of Independence of England. And it was over taxes. The nobles were sick and tired of the king coming to them and taking more and more and more tax money. First time that I know of in world history where a, a, a sitting king on purpose gave up some power, the people gained some rights. The idea of limited government, not unlimited power of the king, but the government, the government is limited and it's limited by the rule. king at some level had to answer to the Magna Carta. It was had to do certain things or not do certain things. First time that ever happened. And this is the basis of America. This idea that the government is limited by the law. The government can't just do whatever it wants. So this is really the, fat, the start of America. Also introduced the idea of representative government. Because those nobles in Parliament those guys were in effect something that limited the power of the king. That they represented the people of And that's what America is. Limited the government, represent the government. Now, after that, after the Magna Carta, there were two more major <clears throat> documents that were signed later on in the 1600s that gave Parliament more power and limited more of the king's power. Uh, Seven, this is seven. Six was the rule of law and the, and the limited government. Now, the petition of right, both of these 1600s, 
repetition. I got four things there, but they're not good for you. Um, first thing, repetition of right told cause. I want to make sure I get this. You can get my little notes out. King Charles had dissolved Parliament. He wasn't happy with it. So he had told them to go home. Um, and so they, they came back with the with the with the bang. We don't know what all happened. It had to be some sort of almost like civil war here. First thing was the king could not tax without Parliament's. This is, that's huge, that the king can't just say, all right, here's what taxes are going to be. The king had to go through Parliament and say, and Parliament had to okay any, any tax increase. This is giving the people power over their money. The king could not just tax automatically. We don't know why the king agreed to this or what happened, but I'm glad it did. You could not throw someone in prison. Without a trial. The king couldn't just say, I don't like it, cut, cut your head off, or throw you in prison. There had to be a trial. This is due process. talking about this a bunch in here. Due process is the right you have as a as an accused person. If you're accused of a crime, the government can't just do whatever they want. You have to go through the process. You have to have rights. That's extremely important. No quartering <clears throat> troops. We don't talk about this before. I bet you didn't have your grade. The king, to save money, would say, troops, if you're in the military, you just go find a house to live in. They'll pay for your food. Because you're they're defending you, so you should help pay for their food and all that kind of stuff. They, they said, no, you can't do this. You cannot force citizens to house troops. This came into play in, in America later. And you could not have martial law. Out. An emergency or a war. Martial law is where you have curfews and the military comes in and they tell they boss you around take over a town. Unless there was an emergency, unless there was war, you couldn't have that. In New Orleans, 16 years ago, they declared martial law because just for the people's protection. Uh, to keep looting from happening, to they didn't want just people go here just for their safety. They so it was an emergency situation, so they declared martial law. But all these things in the early 1600s, the king of England agreed to these four things. That's the big one. I mean, all these are big, but that's huge, that's huge. That really gave the people a lot of power. And last. English Bill of Rights.
This came later. Number one. The king basically had to go through Parliament. Almost everything. There might have been a few things that he had to. But this gave the people control of government for the most part. Not just the taxes, but the king could just. Just say, here's what's here's what's going to happen. The people had to say so. The king had to go through Parliament. couldn't just say, no, this law is in place or this law is gone. The king was not allowed to interfere with elections. elections or meetings. Could not suspend parliament, could not say you can't meet today, couldn't interfere in the election, couldn't say this this person can't run, couldn't take this person and arrest them so they couldn't run for office. King is not allowed, king is separate from parliament, can't interfere with parliament. People, last thing, we put a couple things in here. People had the right to petition, to gripe about stuff. said you couldn't be thrown in prison for no reason. You could hold someone before the trial, and if you keep putting the trial off, you could keep in jail for whatever. This one, you had to have a relatively speedy trial. You had to get things going with it. And they threw in there no cruel or unusual punishment or bail. is a cruel punishment. I'm not anti-death penalty, but that is a cruel punishment. What they meant was if you steal a purse, you're not getting the death penalty. That the, the crime has to fit the punishment, it has to fit the bail. If you if you rob a bank, your bail's going to be different than if you steal a, a cover. Your bails do. It has to match the crime. Now, all these rights 
made in England a special place, and the people took it seriously, and they knew their rights, and they were proud of it. So when they came to America, they're still English citizens. They were very conscious of what their rights were, and when they felt like their rights were being violated. Um, they were part of the greatest country, the greatest empire. They loved being a part of the empire, but they the reason they fought the revolution is because they wanted their rights recognized. We don't want to be separate from you. We want to be treated right. And it just came to blows. And let's say the Packers show up in town. And they start shoving old ladies and grabbing sandwiches and, and taking off of people's cars. And we get tired of it. And we stand up and say, all right, Packers, we're tired of you. Friday night, 7 o'clock, be there. We have a shot. Not one chance. But America got pushed to the point where they were sick of it and couldn't take it and said, whatever. I'd rather play the Packers in a football game and get the crap beat out of me than live like this. And they took on the greatest military in the world and somehow they did it. All right, good enough for today.